Good. I think, yeah, if you are ready, then yep. yes, I'm, I'm good. If you're ready to monitor. Probably grab yep. this mic. Mm -hmm. I think this seems to work. I will see if I can hear anything in the team meeting, but I think it should be a while. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you both hear me? Perfect. Uh, all right. So, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and thanks for those joining us uh, through through Teams. Um, I'm I'm James Baker. For those who don't know, you know me at, at John Moore's. Um, Evo here is going to be monitoring the teams, uh, checking for problems, and um, anything that comes through in the chat. Um, so, yeah, welcome to this this sort of talk in the in the seminar series uh, joined between John Moore's and our colleagues at Liverpool University and Manchester University. Um, before I introduce today's speaker, I'd just like to um, just flag a couple of up upcoming talks. So it's a, it's a busy, busy couple of weeks or so. So we have another talk next Wednesday, um, same time, 1 p.m. So that's Professor uh, Larissa Solbatova. I should have practiced these names, sorry. Um, and then another additional talk actually next week on uh, Thursday. A slightly earlier time, 12 p.m. Um, and that's from Dr. I, I apologize in advance, I don't know how to pronounce his name, but Omar Bar Barakhtar uh, at Sanya. Uh, and then a, thir a third one uh, the following week, uh, Karina Dunlop from, from the, sorry. Okay, so today, as I said, um, our speaker is, is Tom Barker from, from Cardiff University. Uh, Tom. Good. Tom, Tom is a, he has a physics degree from the University of Manchester, um, so that's a, a master's degree, and then he did his PhD also at the University of Manchester, um, and that's actually where I met Tom, so we did our PhDs together with the, the same, same supervisor, and then we sort of went off our separate ways, different countries, so I went to Australia, Tom, Tom went to Scotland, he went to Edinburgh to do a, to do a postdoc there, um, and what, a year or so ago now, he's is a, he moved for a lectureship at uh, Cardiff University, um, and yeah, so I guess from a personal side, I've kept in t contact a lot with Tom um, since his PhD. We did we did collaborate and work together uh, during the PhD. We kept in contact socially, so it's it's really great to have him here now and actually sort of uh, chat a bit about research again um, and see what he's been up to recently. Um, I'm not exactly sure what he's going to be talking to d about today, but. Um, I'd say it's perhaps a slight sort of spin off from some of the more uh, biological data science -y talks we have in this series. Um, but I think some of Tom's work, work has some really important lessons about kind of mathematical modeling in general uh, and some really interesting applications. So, um, yeah, I think, I think that's everything. Over, over to you. Okay, thanks. Very nice introduction, James. Hopefully, I can just transition uh, back to my slides. Oh, here we go. Excellent. So, yeah, continuing modeling of flowing grains and start a uh, nice background image, uh, background white writing, but also the solar system. So uh, here's uh, some uh, asteroid belt rings around the planet just to maybe start our imagination going that uh, granular materials, grains, rocks, uh, working and flowing in some sort of interesting uh, phenomena appear at all sorts of length scales across the natural uh, natural world. Uh, this is probably one of the biggest ones uh, we might maybe think of. Um, but yeah, real grains, grains in the lab, grains in the home, uh, grains in industry. We're maybe looking uh, more at this picture on, on the left. This is a pile of pile of grit, and I thought it's just interesting to really uh, spell out some of the material differences and the kind of key things that differentiate granular materials from the kind of other materials. We might be interested in and on the bottom I've got some uh, microscope images so uh, as you can see granular materials these hard distinct objects with uh, solid uh, kind of distinct surfaces um, in the real world they're all these angular uh, poly dispersed shapes and, and sizes this one's actually not not too poly dispersed but you can probably imagine you might have both powdery uh, type material at the same time as maybe large boulders and we'll see those uh, in a second. But um, yeah, just to kind of contrast with some of the other most uh, common materials so apart from uh, solid objects, we've also got liquid objects, of course. Here is an attempt, I think, by someone, or not, maybe it's just, just me, uh, 
imagining what it'd be like to try and do an electron microscope image of liquid water. And you, so you see here, it's just noise. And that's because uh, water molecules are constantly in thermal motion. Even at room temperature, you know, they're constantly jiggling around. And, you know, you wouldn't really stand a chance of capturing uh, the structures uh, in a microscope image in a finite exposure time because it's all just, you know, a homogeneous um, writhing mess. But here on the next one along, we have a gel, and maybe from biological background, uh, biosciences background, you may be more familiar with uh, these things, but we all became quite, you know, uh, affair with uh, hand sanitizers during the last few years. But you can see here, these have some similarities now with granular materials. They've got structures that are quite clearly defined, have these clear length scales uh, involved, um, and clear boundaries. But of course, here, the kind of boundaries we're talking about are created through chemical processes, chemical um, uh, equilibria, and they're all joining into each other in these kind of networks. So, you know, it's just about, you know, uh, differentiating the materials, but also drawing some, some parallels. And then finally, on the right is uh, metals, you know, classical uh, idealized solids. And in there, maybe you can think of the atoms uh, in their lattices being like discrete discrete objects, maybe discrete particles, uh, if you will, uh, and they end up in these very uh, rigidly defined crystal um, kind of configurations, uh, which we're also going to end up talking about a little bit uh, in this talk as well. But, you know, this is just a kind of global overview of the materials we can all think of. So, yeah, the focus today is going to be on this class of um, kind of material. So, yeah. What happens when we get these materials, these granular materials, to flow around? Uh, these are all quite friendly, useful examples. You pharmaceuticals, we can think in order to make a, um, a tablet of, of drugs, you have to compress a powder uh, in order to make that tablet. That powder had to come from some process, it had to be transported, and that's going to be another thing today. Um, you know, around the home and uh, in the lab, you can imagine flowing uh, these granular materials through all kinds of different geometries. And I know it's been, you know, it's been known for a long time um, that sand flows quite differently um, to water, and, and that allows us to have these kind of nice, reliable sand clocks. This is like a classic clepsydra, where we have a reservoir at the top flowing down into um, a container at the bottom. And yeah, this is a very reliable process that you can actually use for time keeping. But it also starts to um, uh, show us a really interesting and, and novel aspect of uh, granular materials and the flow that, you know, in the stream coming down, the grains are all quite separated, kind of similar to a classical picture we have of a gas. And then as the grains flow along the surface of the pile that's created, you know, they're maybe more like similar to a liquid. But unlike a liquid, which if you pour it into a container, will create a nice flat surface because of uh, uh, gravity and having uh, horizontal equity potentials of its uh, uh, force potential. In this situation, we actually have a transition, a quite sudden transition to solid like behavior, just like we had in the um, metal at the start. These are quite ordered uh, packings and quite strong. They're able to resist the forces of gravity, which would normally try to level off this pile. And so this is going to be one of the major um, difficulties in modeling flowing granular materials. We want to have these transitions between qualitatively quite different states. And, and they're going to, of course, be important for setting the shapes that get generated, setting the flow rate that we're able to achieve with granular materials compared to, um, say, liquids, which have been described really well since 19th century um, or so. But yeah, just as a kind of an extra way to maybe uh, frame the, why we would want to look at discrete particles flowing around and interacting, maybe on a biological level, maybe one, one day we can use uh, some of the models I'll talk about today to influence uh, modeling of much more complicated uh, systems. Maybe uh, this is like uh, red blood cells flowing through an artery, but uh, we can kind of think that maybe there are situations where um, these discrete particles, objects, would also stagnate or also flow very readily uh, and have those same transitions. 
Um, so yeah, granular materials and uh, flowing states are not always that friendly, not always that useful. They can also be quite disruptive, quite deadly. Um, on the left here, we've got uh, a debris flow in a mountainous region coming down uh, an old creek, and we'll see that again in a second. And on the right, we've got a very gas-like granular flow, kind of sustained gas-like state that you would see in a sandstorm. Uh, and of course, neither of these are going to be very fun to uh, to interact with. So uh, yeah, let's just see for a bit of inspiration in this video of this uh, debris avalanche. So this was actually triggered by heavy rainfall uh, at the top of a, of a hill, uh, and that released uh, suddenly a lot of material in a landslide. And that material from the landslide started picking up more and more material from the environment, a kind of snowballing effect, if you will. And there are some interesting parallels with uh, snow avalanches as well. But what we can see here now is this material coming down. And this, this feature was already there. It's an old um, riverbed. But hopefully we can see that the material coming down in this quite scary looking avalanche um, is very dry. It's not saturated with water. You know, you can see all this like um, dust and uh, powder coming up at the front. And we can also see that the head of this um, debris flow is filled with these uh, massive boulders. And so really, in real materials, there are these huge um, differences in length scale between, say, the boulders uh, and the dust. And um, I'm going to be neglecting a, a lot of this, but I think it's important to start to um, map out the kind of uh, necessary ingredients. And, and for me, one of the necessary things is going to be we really need to know how to capture the transition between solid material and this flowing liquid-like regime. Of course, at the top of our hill, we presumably had some solid material to start with. It's transitioned to liquid, and we hope at some point it'll transition back to a solid. We don't want these uh, debris avalanches to be going round and round the world indefinitely. Right? So, um, yeah, so that'll be the idea. But yeah, let's uh, roll things back a bit, back to the material picture. And I'm not going to have these uh, janky. Uh, edges and all these uh, different sizes, I'm going to instead, and uh, as James mentioned, I originally did a, a physics degree and physicists often get criticised for uh, modelling a field of cows as spherical cows in a vacuum. And I'm actually going to do precisely that. I'm going to have spherical or grains in a vacuum. I'm going to neglect all of those extra maybe uh, sometimes important, but let's see what happens with just spheres, unbreakable. So you know, they're, they're perfectly hard and they don't really deform that much and you can't uh, smash them apart and, and create new material, new uh, new numbers of particles, so conserved number of particles, a uniform density. And I've said here electrostatically inert, but actually I'm going to neglect all those potential extra physics that you might get with uh, uh, nanoscale features of, um, you know, biological systems, all that other uh, interest in biochemistry. But the point is that I'm going to be looking at systems composed of many of these perfect spheres and you know this is already a very challenging task so hopefully you see that it's a necessary uh, journey to go on in order to start um, making your life even harder with uh, all the extra physics of uh, other systems. So yeah so I'm going to start from this point of view of from the grain uh, but also in a practical sense we can go ahead and run simulations of grains in isolation. You know, we know how a sphere travels through a vacuum very precisely. This is, you know, all the way back to Newton. We've got Newton's equations of motion, and we can also think if it hits a, a solid surface, you know, there's going to be some dissipation there. We're not going to um, bounce perfectly when we hit the surface. We're going to lose a bit of energy, and we're going to decay away, and that's just. Uh, captured by a restitution coefficient, you know, the uh, height of the ball uh, after you've dropped it relative to the position you've dropped it to is uh, in the restitution coefficient. So a bit of dissipation, and um, that's between uh, a grain and, say, a flat plane. You can also do this um, with many grains, uh, resolve the contacts at collision, and start playing around with things that look like a granular gas. All these um, perfect spheres banging into each other. Uh, fully resolved just using, you know, F equals MA, Newton's, Newton's equation of motion, you know, you can have gravity, you can turn gravity off, you can play loads of interesting uh, interesting games um, just using these very basic um, equations. 
Of course, when we start getting towards real systems that have many hundreds of thousands or millions of particles, this is going to become incredibly computationally expensive. So the kind of overarching theme of this talk is to learn things from the dynamics of these simulations, from the properties of grains and the dynamics of the grain scale, but develop continuum models that can handle uh, material that is many, many thousands of um, grain diameters uh, across. And so, yeah, just for a bit more clarity on this method, uh, I'm going to be using this discrete element method. It's, it's just a certain way of doing these um, particle simulations. It allows a little overlap between the, the particles, as I say, spring constant dissipation, a bit of surface friction as well. You know, we know that granular materials uh, are generally quite, quite frictional, but yeah, we don't really need to worry about the details of this today. But yeah, how good are these DEM simulations? So really, I want to be doing this kind of process at the top. I want to have some experiments and the match with DEM, DEM matches with theory, and hopefully I can loop back around and start matching uh, theory with experiments, theory with what happens out there in nature. But to start with, uh, I thought I'll just look in the literature uh, at this DEM model I'm, I'm using. And yeah, from the, this nice paper, they didn't supply a, a video but they did supply a series of, of images, which, uh, when played like this, almost looks like a video, right? Um, but yeah, as you can see, this connection has been quite well established. They had a, quite a novel experiment, um, flowing grains, and I, I can try and play this again, flowing grains down an incline with an obstacle in the middle, a kind of ridge, if you will, catching the grains. And we can kind of see that the DEM simulation on the left is matched matching quite well what we see in the experiments. In particular, we've got these piles of solid material. Um, as you can see, this kind of um, the, the pile has this kind of conical or, or triangular shape, quite similar to what we had in the sand clock. So I'm saying that this connection between experiments and DEM is something that people are out there establishing. That's going to be less of an interest to me. I'm going to now do the connection of DEM to develop a theory and have, an, have a conversation on this next connection. So I, as Jim said, I was working in Edinburgh. I was actually working in an engineering department and I went to a, a talk about powder flow and powder processing. Of course, uh, you know, it's in agriculture, it's in industry, you know, uh, especially at the moment, there's a lot of interest in 3D printing. And 3D printing takes these little plastic pellets and they have to feed them at a reasonable rate into a region where they get melted and then become uh, liquid before setting again into um, a plastic object. But anyway, so this was kind of inspired then by that prototypical geometry that we see in industry that we have a big hopper at the top where uh, we have some material that uh, we're going to be using in this process. We have this straight segment, which is called often a standpipe, which transports the material from the hopper to the region where it's going to be needed. You can imagine this maybe in the outlet of your 3D printer. And again, there's another hopper at the bottom here, which, you know, normally this is open and closed with like a gate, but it again has some, it has some kind of opening angle which can control uh, the flow rate. And you see on the left here, these three cases, I've actually rotated these 90 degrees. So on the left, gravity is pointing left to right rather than up and down just for uh, be able to fit it on the slide. Um, and you can see here, different opening angles lead to different flows. I mean, we know that if we fully close this outlet, we're not going to get any flow, right? And if we fully straight open it, it turns out, we get a very fast, quite uh, gas-like flow, which actually is not very uh, useful in a lot of uh, these applications because material just ends up going everywhere. It's too rapid, it's not very controlled, and you get some other fluctuations um, with that. Uh, I think I can play this as a video. Yeah, so here you see in the animation, uh, when you're very close to the closed outlet, you get all these waves traveling through the system. It's kind of a stop start. You can think in like traffic flow um, and other kind of jamming, unjamming um, systems. I'll play that again. Um, and at the bottom, as I say, uh, there's all this detachment from the wall. And you might as well just be dropping the material straight out of the top hopper. You've not gained anything by having this um, this shoot to guide things. But in the middle case, and this is what I'm going to focus 
uh, primarily on today, we have a nice, steady, uh, uniform, uh, well-behaved flow that's going to give us a controlled um, outlet flux. The amount of material per second is something we can control in a very narrow kind of Goldilocks range of opening angles in the middle. And this is what we probably want from an industrial point of view. And so, yeah, so I zoomed in now on that, uh, that standby, on the vertical parallel sidewall section, far away from the input hopper, far away from the output hopper. And so one of the tests we did is to just take that section from that big full uh, 2D, actually it's 3D simulation, uh, and put it in a periodic cell. And so now all the material that comes out of the bottom, goes back into the top and loops around. And so one of the first things we did is to confirm that nothing really changes. That section of the pipe um, that we can go back to, um, that's like this well-behaved section, maybe around here or something, that isn't really changing in the lab frame, is also not changing in my periodic cell. So it really is like only worried that the, the state of this flow only cares about where the boundaries are and how much material is in there. And so the kind of really important control parameters are obviously the dimensions in this 2D uh, slice, but also the volume fraction. So this phi, and here I call phi zero, is like my initial volume fraction if I start in this periodic cell, is scaling with the number of particles, the volume of the particle versus the total volume available in my cell. So this is how densely packed things are. And so you can see there's a, a kind of connection now between opening and closing this angle and how densely packed the material is back up in the chute. If I really open my end of my chute, I'm just going to get a low density and everything flows out. If I really close it, everything compacts into a, a high density. So now I'm just reducing down a kind of a process of reducing the necessary variables in the problem to just this one um, non-dimensional variable, the mean packing packing fraction, and the dimension of the problem as well. So um, yeah, so it turns out for these certain regimes, we have this nice um, connection to this picture I showed at the start, these kind of three phases or maybe two phases for certain types of flow, where in the center of the shoot, we have very much solid-like behavior. We can tell this uh, from these colors. These colors are the vertical uh, velocity, uh, how fast everything's moving. The fact that all the material in the center is red means they're all moving as one. So if they're all moving as one, that's just, even though it's the fastest velocity, it's kind of moving just like a solid object would move. Think like the front of a train or something. All the pieces of that are moving at the same velocity. Whereas in the walls here, there's this kind of matching regions to the static frictional sidewalls um, that I've glued together. These black particles are fixed in this frame. And so we can see that that's kind of the only really interesting region that um, potentially mediates, and as we'll see, it will mediate the speed at which the central plug moves up. And so this is one way of looking at things. Um, I thought about looking thing, at things in a slightly different way, and this now is a 2D version of this system rather than 3D to make it clearer about what we can look at. Um, the colors here are the number of particles that a particle is making contact with. So these by the blue ones by the wall at the snapshot that I took are not actually touching another grain. They look very close, some of them, but they're not actually currently overlapping. Um, lighter blue is one contact, and then we go all the way up to the center of this plug region where we've got red, really densely packed, but also touching all their neighbors. The black lines on here are the center, center um, contact point lines, so these particles will be contacting at the point that that line intersects the two um, circles. And so you can see there's a very clear distinction between this plug in the middle and these regions of the wall. The regions of the wall is these um, kind of like very sudden, and we'll see it in the video, um, very sudden transmissions of force. Whereas in the center, we're very close to a stable packing. There are some fluctuations making their way in, but you can see the particles really don't move relative to their neighbors. They're all just stuck there. Whereas at the walls, they're always moving around each other. You know, they're rearranging and sometimes they're freely rearranging. And that's this idea coming from physics of like mean free path about how you define when you've got a gas versus a liquid. Well, 
the mean free pass sometimes here is long enough that you can completely rearrange with your neighbor without touching anything. You don't have to move any other um, particle around. Okay, so we really do have these three, three phases in here. So modeling, let's build uh, a model. And so one of the big kind of paradigms in granular flow modeling uh, in recent years has been what's called local rheology. And so the idea there is we take this very complex, spatially varying, time varying flow, and we say actually, and here I've only plotted, plotted 35 grains across because I want to see the detail, but really in these industrial processes, we're thinking like thousands, tens of thousands of grains across, right? But the idea is you can zoom in on a certain section of this flow to get a representative sample. You can say if what's happening locally in one small region of the flow can be understood, then we can connect all those small regions together to describe the system. And this is, you know, kind of homogenization going from a discrete situation to a continuous situation. It's not particularly done formally here, but um, this is the, the concept that you can start with these small homogeneous um, samples in a fully periodic box. You can forget get gravity and all of those things, and you can just do experiments on these particles in action and then imagine that if you've done it at one strain rate, if you've done it at one packing density, we can then move back to the full complex picture using this paradigm. And so on this scale, if I zoom in, even if my velocity profile is varying quite complexly, we know from, from basic mathematics, if I zoom in close enough, I can think of this as a combination of linear segments, right? Any sort of funky nonlinear um, smoothly varying profile I can think of simple linear piecewise segments. And so here I literally have that. I have one um, shear rate, one strain rate across my sample. So that's my strain rate, gamma dot, the change in the velocity uh, is position. My volume fraction now is not the global volume fraction of my full big complex system. It's a local volume fraction in my tiny cell. It's the volume of these particles versus the volume they could occupy. And then we also importantly link these kinematic or kind of natural um, uh, deformation variables to the stresses uh, exerted either on the sample or by the sample. Okay, you can kind of think in both ways. But this is like just like Newton revolutionized uh, physics in the 19th century by or 18th century by linking force with acceleration. This is the same in the continuum sense of linking these kinematic variables to your stress variables. And this is the game we're always playing with rheology, right? Linking motion to the stresses. And so this system, this simple homogeneous single strain rate system has these three nice non-dimensional groupings. You have the volume fraction is already non-dimensional. It's just, you know, ratio of volumes. And um, you also have this bulk friction uh, mu, which is a ratio of the shear stress that's acting kind of like tangentially at each edge of our sample to the pressure, which is an isotropic um, force. You know, if you pump up your bike tire and feel the pressure there, it's the same everywhere. It's the same in every every direction. So you can take the ratio of those to form another non-dimensional number. But then the third key non-dimensional number, and this was quite a revolutionary um, kind of construction, is this inertial number, which is a way to non-dimensionalize the strain rate. Remember on these linear uh, segments, that strain rate is just a homogeneous constant value. We, but it turns out you can non-dimensionalize that through this special combination. We see we've got divide by square root of pressure. So we're connecting now very explicitly the deformation to the forces, to the stresses. But we also, in order to do this non-dimensionalization, had to bring in these two other numbers. D here is the grain diameter, and rho star is the density of the grains. So this is really nice, it's doing connecting the grain scale information to these bulk properties of deformation and stress in a single number. And that's uh, quite a useful, uh, powerful thing. And once we've got these non-dimensional variables, we can start seeing how they all link together. So I'm doing, gonna do a little, little test now. So imagine I've got my sample of grains and forgetting gravity, so maybe you can think of it as a load of uh, marbles on the table and you know, doing your hands like this to generate the generate shear. If I start my sample from some packing fraction and I increase the strain rate, so I'm moving my hands faster and faster, 
what do we think is going to happen to the volume fraction? Do we think that as I shear it, the sample will expand or will it uh, compress together? Let's see, hands for expand. Expand, expand and compress together when I share it, compress. Uh, it, was quite, it was quite even numbers. So uh, yeah, let's see what the data says from my uh, vertical shoot. So on the bottom here, I have my shearing rate. So this is how fast I'm shearing and this is the volume fraction. And so as I shear faster and faster, my sample in this uh, little homogeneous picture actually expands. I actually get less and less volume fraction, okay? You can imagine really, really kicking your system with a fast strain rate, and that would be more like a granular gas. The particles would really have a lot of energy to be colliding into each other that would cause them to expand. And then very, very slow deformations are able to um, support these very close um, close packing fractions. So the next, uh, next question, how about this bulk friction? So we say it's the ratio of how hard I'm shearing to how hard the material pushes back. How does that change if this time I'm going to change the volume fraction? If I make the volume fraction higher, I've got more and more material in there. What do we think is going to happen to the bulk friction? Hands for the bulk friction is going to increase when I've got more material in there. So four, five, how about decrease? Two for decrease, yeah. Decrease. So here we go, yeah, we actually get a decrease. Now this is somewhat counterintuitive. I'm putting more and more particles in there, the more and more densely packed. We think the idea of friction is gonna increase, but actually this is, you know, friction is how much normal force do I have for a certain tangential force? How do the, they link together? But when I've got more and more densely packed grains, they're more and more likely to be hitting each other end on. There's not any room for them to go past each other. This was the idea. So at lower density, they, they're sliding past each other. When they slide past each other, they've got more tangential compared to their normal force. They're able to do these glancing blows. And that's really what you can think. You can think this non-dimensional number, tau of p, but you could also think of it as an angle. And that angle could represent how far away you are from head-on collisions. And so, yeah. So the other thing here is after putting all this data together, you see it's kind of a bit complicated. There's a bit of maybe nonlinearity going on. These two dashed lines, um, at these special volume fractions, um, are really telling us whereabouts this central plug is, where the solid behavior is happening. But outside here, if we really squint our eyes, we can maybe think that these two relationships are quite linear, right? This one especially, you can maybe draw a line through here, and on this one, maybe you could draw a line, but it'd start getting messed around um, just before you hit that black dashed line. And so that was my idea. How bad is it to take linear trends for these relationships? You know, we've also found that we can relate phi and i, we can relate mu and phi, so can we also relate mu and i? Yeah, of course, you're able to now commute between any of these three variables and create a model that is really um, reflecting all of those. And so putting all that together, and this we don't need to think too much too much about, but you know, whenever I'm going to go and solve these equations, you know, I need um, some principles um, to guide that in order to have conservation laws in order to generate equations. And so actually, I'm only going to use very simple ones: uh, force balance, like so momentum balance in the cross direction. That actually gives me that the pressure is constant. In the downstream direction, I have a change in my shear stress as I go towards the center of the shoot. Interestingly, this equation two is telling me that the shear stress starts on one side uh, negative and ends on the other side positive. What this is saying is I need a certain traction at the wall in order to oppose gravity, okay? And that uh, traction is actually gonna be created by the stress at the wall. This condition here now, it's kind of a boundary condition, is telling me that at my steady state, when everything's just flowing, um, time invariant, I actually have this traction of the wall perfectly balancing the weight of the material. So this is quite um, intuitive in many ways. Of course, we've got conservation of mass. We don't, we're not creating or deleting any grains. And I'm also imagining that my walls are so frictional, so bumpy, that I have no slip at the walls. The velocity is, is precisely zero there. So that gives me boundary conditions and the uh, momentum balance gives me uh, the equations. And so what I decided to do is 
completely neglect what is happening inside the plug. I just think this is just like a solid block, you've just dropped it down a chute, and yes, it's been slowed down by its connection to the walls, but I'm just going to treat it as a perfect plug, uh, zero strain rate, and a certain packing in there, which I can specify, and I can look at the data and, and somehow suggest something for that central region. As I said, these connections between the packing and the strain rate, the friction and the packing, I'm going to have these linear trends which are not perfect, not uh, doing the right thing all the time, but you know it's a good place to start. The nice thing is, with these linear forms and these ODEs which came from the momentum bounds, I can actually get exact solutions. I can solve these ODEs perfectly, especially you can see maybe this one on the left, the 5 IDX is just some constant times 5. I mean, what could be easy enough? It just has exponential solutions. And with these constraints that I put on, mass conservation, the shear stress of the wall, I can find all those um, uh, constants of integration uh, from these two equations. So let's see how it, how it works. So as I say, you know, it's kind of piecewise. I'm just having a constant packing in the middle and these exponential forms in the inertial or the, the shearing zones at the side. I've kind of done this piecewise um, separation of the plug from the um, from the shearing zones. And so I was pretty amazed and pretty surprised by how well this can work. It really doesn't get all the nonlinearity, but it starts to, um, you know, reflect a little bit what's happening with phi, but it definitely reflects what's happening with the velocity. The velocity profiles, by the way, they start out linear. You've got something a times x, a linear increasing trend, but then at some point, this 1 minus e to the x starts killing things off. And it kills things off so that it would become negative, but it goes precisely to zero strain rate as we hit the edge of the plug. Okay. Anyway, just a bit of uh, mathematical background there. But so we can see that for this case that I've chosen, this kind of like uh, certain mean packing fraction, um, certain particle properties, uh, this is not too bad an idea. Um, this, of course, needed me to pr propose some values for these constants in the um, these new linear trends, phi c, a, mu c, p, uh, you know, I've got four fitting constants, so, you know, maybe you're thinking, oh, this is not, not that impressive, but we can, we can do this a bit more systematically now. We can change the width of the shoot to many different widths, and we can change the mean packing fraction that I put in there. They're my only two control variables in this geometry, uh, and look at how um, this all fits together. Surprising, maybe not surprisingly, with how bad those linear fits might have been in the phi mu space, it's really not that great um, for phi as a function of x, but surprisingly, it's capturing um, the velocity. And so, you know, it's still quite a usable tool because the velocity is quite important. The velocity is telling me how much material and how quickly it's coming out of the bottom of my cell. This is precisely what the guys in industry want to know, right? They want to know. If I change my shoot properties, uh, make it wider, make it shorter, open this uh, outlet to different angles, how fast is the material going to come out? Um, and so this is then establishing those connections in a very simple, um, maybe even slightly crappy model. Um, we can also try this on a different geometry. So, you know, as mathematicians, we love it when uh, we can do 1D problems, and that previous problem with the parallel walls was naturally 1D. I just have x coordinate. But I can also straight away do um, pipes as well because you know you can imagine things being invariant uh, theta. So everywhere in the pipe, I just have a zero to the edge of the pipe coordinate, another 1D problem. And again, doing the same experiments, making the pipe wider, putting more and more particles in there, and we can match really nicely the velocity fields, and we can match okay um, the volume fraction fields as well. Um, but yeah, so to finish. Uh, one of the really, really nice things with playing with such a simple model, and if you get like good matching like we just happen to do um, in general, that's great. But this really reveals now the core connection between my control variables. Here it's just you know two control variables, but the output uh, quantities, like the mass flow rate, as I've been saying, this is what an industry they're most, most interested in. And it's these kind of scaling laws which are the most important because in industry, they're not going to have perfect spheres. They're not going to be in a vacuum. They're not going to be perfectly rough walls. There's going to be all sorts of things that start creeping in. But it's really nice to know how this 
fundamentally idealized system uh, connects these variables together, and, and this is through scaling laws. So this now is uh, how the shear zone width, this delta, changes as I change the width of my shoot. And we found that's a linear trend in our, in our study. Previous studies, just looking at the experiments, were starting to claim that maybe the shear zones were always 10 grain diameters across. That's something we've very much debunked. Um, in the flow rate regimes, it actually interestingly matters whether you are in a vertical sidewall arrangement like a square pipe, rectangular pipe, or if you're in this circular geometry. And so this, this geometric changes mean that changing the width of the pipe has a slightly different connection to how the mass flow rate changes. And so it's these kind of power laws, which are so simple for a, any engineer in a practical application to have in mind to go and compute. How, if I make my uh, pipe twice as big, how much more mass flow do I get? So this is the kind of output of, of the analysis. So yeah, thanks for listening. And uh, yeah, I'll take any questions. Uh, yeah, thanks for that really nice talk, Tom. Um, I think so. Evo is going to be on the teams for. Can you hear me? I'm shouting loudly. Um, Evo is on the teams for those people wanting to send questions through the chat or or unmute your mic on teams. Um, but I guess we'll have any questions for anyone in the audience as well. Um, okay, it's very impressive how uh, that sort of linear fit then gets you those solutions. Uh, I guess the natural question is, um, have you tried? say, a quadratic fit, I and mean, I understand probably you don't get uh, analytic solutions for that, so maybe you could solve the equations numerically then. Yeah, yeah, so I've gone and solved the equations numerically, I can, I can have a, a non-linear fit that goes all the way into the centre of the plug, and um, there was some, there is some variation in there that you can kind of use to justify those, those non-linearities, and yeah, I can solve that numerically, and it fits much better for those flow fields. On the diagram, the final diagram, the connection between the kind of bulk variables, it makes very little difference, as you maybe hope. But yeah, definitely you can go and solve numerically. I think quadratic, you could maybe even make some progress analytically, but you yeah. know. <laughs> so I have a question from um, the chat. Yeah. Should I um, ask the person to unmute himself? Yeah, sure. Sorry. So, so, so Andre, if you can hear me, would you like to unmute yourself yeah. and ask your question? Yes. Uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity, and thanks, Tom, for such a interesting uh, work. I got a question. If you have some grain flowing or free fall into a channel, and you would like to spray uh, a substance on it, or let's say you want to scan a laser across this seed, would you be able to simulate this kind of things? Yeah, I think that's a yeah, very interesting question. Thanks for that. I think, um, yeah, I think in an experiment, there's many things uh, you can do um, uh, beyond and add extra physics in experiments. And I'd be interested actually to see how to build those physics into these discrete models. It's not really my expertise, the kind of discrete description. Like I say, I'm more interested in moving from these particle simulations into uh, the continuum uh, to, in order to inform a continuum formulation. But yeah, I think there's extra physics and, and things like spraying, you know, probably accessing uh, much more dynamic gas-like regimes at which these kind of local theories, or at least uh, the key dimensionless variables I've chosen, uh, start to become uh, less prominent. Thank you. It's just that we we are looking into a, a problem where we want to treat some seed using laser. Yeah. So we want the laser to fall onto all the seeds, to treat all the seeds as they're falling. So we would like to know in your simulation what kind of density or the amount of seed that we can let fall in one go to be able to treat them at the same time. Yeah, yeah, no, that's really interesting. I think. Of course, my simulation is two dimensions, and you can quite easily imagine illuminating a, a slice of all of these circles. In 3D, they're, of course, going to uh, cast shadows on each other, right? Is this the issue you're thinking of? That um, Probably you would re require quite a low density in order to try and avoid 
such uh, optical blocking of uh, your treatment. Is that is that the idea? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I think that that sort of system is probably closer to these gas-like dynamics. There's, there's a well-developed uh, kinetic theory. The other thing is when you have uh, low density, you have interactions with the air. And maybe I don't know how big your brains are, but, you know, they're probably interacting with the air, which I've neglected, but that can co become more important uh, when we have less contact between the brains. Thank you very much. Cheers. I hope I can get your contact so we can discuss later on. Oh, of course, yeah. I'd be really interested to see what you, you've been doing. Yeah, uh, that'd be really, really nice. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Any other questions? Hi there, George Nikitas from Civil Engineering Department. Hi. I would like to ask you previously, you asked the question whether the that sample, if you see it, if you see it, whether it will compact or expand. Yeah. <laughs> can you please? Uh, Tell us, because from geotechnical, because I'm geotechnical, we know that this is affected from how closely they, they are packed together. Yeah, yeah. So exactly. essentially, if they're closely packed together, it will expand. So, a really and then good it point. Will... so uh, yeah, yeah. So that whole experiment, I was, I was playing in this very low packing region. As soon as we cross this black line, we start getting to jam states, and those jam states is you know, you're maybe going from a critical state solar mechanics kind of perspective. They are that theory is really relevant in between this dashed black line and the dashed red line. In that situation, the current packing of the grains and the current pressure can affect whether when you shear it, it expands or it contracts. It depends uh, whereabouts on the yield surface you are relative to the critical state line, right? You could either compact or expand. But as soon as we're at a low density, there really is only one situation, uh, and that is that we drive the particles to create a larger pressure uh, because we have this uh, um, kind of quadratic one-to-one uh, -one relation between the strain rate and the pressure in this inertial regime. Yeah, so it's a really good point. In, the, in that other region, there's all sorts of interesting phenomena that happen with non-linear connections between the pressure and uh, non-monotonic connections between the pressure and the, and the shear rate. Perfect. Can I ask another question? Oh, oh, sure, yeah. <laughs> so, what other applications are you looking into applying discrete element modeling? Um, I mean, as I say, the discrete element modeling to me is a is a really neat tool for me to get some justification for forming the continuum uh, modeling. You know, we do uh, flows down an inclined plane to uh, have an eye a start building an intuition about debris avalanches. Um, and other kind of geophysical flow phenomena, uh, heat formation, you know, flow on top of a, a pile and those kind of things. But, you know, as I said, you know, if you're really going to go for some re fully realistic, fully complicated problem, DEM is very expensive. Uh, and, you know, we're trying to maybe uh, slowly work towards complexity. Okay. So, shall I continue my questions or oh, yeah. someone else wants keep to? Going, keep going, keep going. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> If not, I'll continue. So, <laughs> no so yes, I totally agree. There are many applications for DM. The, the applications are only limited to our imagination. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And the other thing that I would like to ask, uh, have you thought the next step, start calibrating actually the actual material? Because uh, to use more spheres, for example, to for example, test the material in terms of stiffness of the material, in terms of stress strain properties yeah yeah i'm working actually with guys at edinburgh university who do material characterization they use uh, ft4 rheometry uh, of granular materials to get an idea of uh, all these uh, fitting constants i don't know where i put them uh, yeah so i mean my model has these four fitting constants in this linear um regime and yeah you could you can tune those to different physical materials um but yeah, that's still, I'd say, ongoing work in, in order to really have uh, a full understanding of the output from a rheometer that is often working quite close to this critical regime where you have to compact enough in order to get a nice uniform um, deformation inside your sample. And so maybe it's not in this inertial regime unless you spin very quickly. So it's still quite difficult, I think. 
I would say, I think as a, just to add to that, as a sort of an academic community, we haven't really standardized the, the calibration test, although maybe engineering is a bit better than they had at K-Well to measure the um, stiffness or something. We have this standard test and everyone knows if you do this standard test, that's, that's how you get it. Um, we haven't really got that far yet in the granular community, I think. Yeah, I think there needs to be a conversation between the theory and the experiments in order to get something that is fully diagnostic and is fully clear because these things can get muddled up in all sorts of other effects at the same time. Perfect, thank you. Cheers. Anything on the teams? Or? No, um, so maybe just a last couple, a bit more general context. I guess in the spirit of this being a sort of, uh, or sometimes being biologically focused, and you mentioned the blood <laughs> cells, uh, I just wanted a bit of a sort of a thought or an outlook on, you know, do we have hope? there um in, in let's say using dm to simulate blood cells or what, what are the, yeah. the hardest the hardest factor in that so i guess the, the only step in that direction i've made recently is to work on suspensions and dense suspensions where you have a background fluid um that is uh, mediating interactions as well and yeah one of the interesting things there is i've been talking about how the um straining faster and faster links to uh, greater and greater stresses there, if you strain things very slowly, it's almost like the particles never get a chance to touch. They're always interacting in a hydrodynamic way that never uh, causes them to interact. Whereas if you shear fast enough, you have both um, this uh, granular, dry granular contacting friction as well as the hydrodynamics. And I think that's one step towards that picture of having blood cells in uh, background fluid. But of course, we also have the left scales involved, the chemistry involved, uh, you know, maybe this is uh, for the next generation beyond us, us even, but uh, yeah, we'll start taking the baby steps first. Run before, uh, walk before you can run, I guess. <laughs> all right, well, if there's, um, if there's no more questions, uh, I think you could join me all in thanking, uh, thanking Tom again for a really, really interesting talk. Thank everybody for joining remotely as well. I guess we can stop the recording there as well. Put a lot of grains in a background fluid, you start getting for where I am. So, what happens to that point? Does it is it always the